Hi, uh, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Salem Witch Trials. That's what this song is about from the Eagles. Salem Witch Trials, The First Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And so this is a pretty big deal. Um, it's about religion in the colonies again. Uh, it's really, really important for a number of reasons. Listen to this. Well, it's not really the same as what we see with um, in the Salem witch trials, but let's talk about that. So first and foremost, um, what we learn about the Salem witch trials is that it's really a reflection of the Puritans, Puritan religious beliefs. Um, one big thing I want you to understand is this concept of witchcraft. Um, if you're a Latino, you probably know about witchcraft. It's part of the Latin culture. Um, I know a lot about um, witchcraft based on my background. I was married for 25 years to a witch. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but it is a, an interesting thing in the Latin culture. My ex-wife's family you know, believed in superstitions of witchcraft which they believe, you know, they would do, you know, rituals, um, purification rituals, burning incense through the house or with holy water. There's this thing called the huevo, which is a, they, they go to the witch and the, they take a, an egg and they rub it across the body and it sucks out the evil and they can read your fortune, etc. with that. And so um, La Latinos are familiar with it. And there's another concept called Santeria. Uh, where they do blood sacrifices. They do that a lot in the Caribbean, which is Afro-Caribbean um, kind of Christian-based witchcraft. But so it's, there's a lot of witch, witchcraft, witches, concepts in popular culture. So one of the big ideas is that uh, what happens with the Salem witchcraft trials is a reflection of the Puritan religious zealotry. Um, again, the Puritan concept, they believed that Satan and the devil were involved in daily life. If something bad happened, they would blame it on the devil or Satan. And witches are the brides of Satan, are, you know, in, in, according to this belief structure, they're involved in satanic rituals. And so. If this was a daily occurrence, that God is so benevolent, but also because the devil is around, that, that they would explain unexplainable things using the devil and witchcraft. That was a daily part of their beliefs. And again, this is mostly in New England where their religious beliefs are really strong. The South, they're not going to have any of the Salem witch trials down there. Um, and so the basic essence of it, this is 1692. This is... What is that? A 70 years after um, Plymouth is established. Um, what happens is somebody com accuses someone of being a witch. Adolescent girls, you know, bad things are happening. You're in this religious context, this, this superstitious context. And we get accusations. Uh, mostly it was these young girls that were um, making these claims against innocent people. Now what's interesting about this is that they would have trials. And if you were a religious person and you lie, that is a sin and you're going to go to hell, etc. But it, so you had the highly religious people were were telling the truth. I am not a witch. They were, they were seen as lies and that they were accused just by innuendo. There's no real proof. Nineteen people were executed. Two die in jail. One is tortured to death. They stopped the witch trials when prominent people in the uh, colony were accused, like 
the judge's wife, etc. And so in the very beginning it was because of religious-based issues and then it became just a hysterical fear. Hysteria is a is a um, irrational fear. And so what we think of a witch hunt today as Donald Trump has been claiming, I'm a victim of a witch hunt. I'm a victim of a witch hunt. There's nothing. It's a hoax. It's wrong. But basically, if you were accused, you could, they could save their lives only by confessing and impl implicating others. So if I was to say, you know, so-and-so is a witch, she would go on, on trial and say, uh, I am, um, if she admitted it, she would be forgiven. So if she admitted it, which would be a lie, <laughs> then you're forgiven and then you live. But you also had to accuse some of other people. So you would say, I was involved, but also Susie over there was involved. And then Susie's a really religious, devout person, says, no, I wasn't, and this is a lie. Then she would be persecuted and that's how it worked. If if she would take, if she would lie, she would save her life. She tells the truth, she would be killed. So again, a witch hunt is a hysterical reaction without basis in reality, and that's why Donald Trump keeps saying, "Oh, it's a witch hunt that I got helped by the Russians," or "Oh, my, you know, I've done anything wrong. It's a witch hunt." And again, we see this again in the 1950s when we get to the Red Scare of the 50s. We'll come back to that later. Mostly women, middle-aged widows, few or no children, had low social position. These are the people who get accused in Salem. Um, again, it's seen as a bias against women. It's seen as like a jealousy. People were jealous of these women, they, maybe they were outspoken and they were easy targets. People didn't mind harassing them. And that's kind of the big picture of the Salem witch trials. But the number one thing you wanna know, it's a reflection of the religious beliefs, zealotry of the Puritans. Okay. All right. Good. Let's continue. Now we're going to talk about this is extremely important. It's called the Great Awakening. This is the first Great Awakening. There are two. Uh, their first one is 1730s. The second one is 1830s. And they're very important. Um, when you talk about the Great Awakening, you're talking about awakening to religion. So the way... I want you to see this, and I'm going to draw a timeline here. Okay, so we got 1607 and 1620, 1630. Remember, this is Jamestown, this is Plymouth, this is the Great Migration in Massachusetts Bay, right? Um, and then we're going to get up here to 1730s. What's going on here in, we're specifically um, talking about religious attitudes. The religious attitudes that you're seeing here are um, most in New England, right? It's Puritans. And they believe in what we call Calvinism and they believe in um, what we call predestination. Okay, that's mostly New England. Predestination, remember, said that you, we only certain people are saved. Only some of us can be saved. That means go to heaven, right? The elect, remember we talked about that, the elect. This is the Puritan beliefs. So if you go, uh, what's happening here in, if we did do another, another uh, kind of a chart on this, look at this. High level of Puritan beliefs and then time. 
So in the early 1620s to about 1700, you start here with a high level of Puritan beliefs. But over time, it declines because people are moving away from the center. And you, so you have a religious attitudes are declining over time. Boom, 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 boom. And this is where the first Great Awakening takes place. And so the question is, well, why are, why, why are religious beliefs declining right here? Well, 1650s, 1670s, it's because people are moving away from the focus of the community. Remember, what's going on in this early era is that you're getting a ton of people coming, and they're, they start in Massachusetts Bay, they start in Plymouth, and then they move out to Connecticut, and then they move out to other areas. And so what ends up happening is you got this, because the, 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 the town communities are here and people are moving out to farther, more rural areas, they lose their religion. They lose, the preachers aren't close. They're on isolated farms in the countryside. And that accounts for a lot of the decline. You're not as religious if you're farther away from town. Do you get it? And so you have this phenomena, late 1600s, early 1700s, a, a de we call that a decline in religious piety. A decline in religious piety. Another reason why people were declining is this predestination. This is important. This predestination idea said that um, God decides who goes to heaven, who is saved. The person has, individuals have no power, can do nothing. No, you can do nothing to be saved. It's automatic. God has predetermined. Okay, so that idea is not popular. It's not good. And that's what the second great or the first great awakening is about. It's changing the old predestination. The first great awakening cancels out predestination. It's a new um, belief, a Christian belief. It's not as strict as these Puritans were. So here's the first thing. It starts in the West, Western New England. So you got Massachusetts, there's Cape Cod right here, right? It's, it's over here in the West because they had less organized religion. Now, what's really different about the First Great Awakening is that it's stated, it's, it's message, the message of the First Great Awakening is that everyone can be saved. And that if you're a religious person, this is a great, great message. It's, the, it's closer to the Christian beliefs than anything that, you know, Jesus said, everyone is equal, everyone can be saved. All you have to do is believe and you are saved. And that is a fundamental message in the first great awakening. And here are the characteristics of it. Evangelism means preachers. Even evangelism means preachers. Jeremiads are types of sermons that are, we call these fire and brimstone sermons. Brimstone is what is burning in hell. It smells like sulfur, right? That's, that's, that's the idea. Jeremiads are the sermons from the Old Testament. Appeal to women. Women were a fundamental, fundamental factor in the First Great Awakening because they spread it to their children. They forced the husbands to engage in it, and they really embrace this First Great Awakening idea. The uh, sermons, the Jeremiads, emphasize the, a new relationship with God, an individual relationship with God. Everyone can be saved. They must read the Bible. They must, go, um, you know, follow the rules of Jesus, and you will be saved. So you do have agency. You do, it's not predestination anymore. 
um, again, the decline, that's, when you get to this decline, what are some examples of it? They call it the halfway covenant. So early in the colony, you had tons of people that were full members. And then as time goes on, people start declining, and they are only half members of the, Cal of the Calvinist church. Those are known as the halfway covenant. These people are the ones who turn towards the, the Great Awakening because the message is, again, everyone can be saved. Not, and if you're halfway, no, you can be fully saved. Do you get it? So again, the message is equality, everyone can be saved. Traveling preachers would go through, imagine this, this is a country road, you'd have a settlement here, a settlement here, you know, farms, and the preachers come into town and they have a big camp meeting. Everybody in the region goes to hear the preacher. It becomes a form of entertainment as well as religion, and they have these things called camp meetings. Now, what's also interesting about this, it becomes popular in the North. The North and the South experience this revival, this growth, rebirth of religion. So we have camp meetings. Again, what are the messages? More messaging. Fear God and Satan. Live a moral life. Work hard read the Bible, and have a personal relationship with God, believe, do these things, all of these things, and you can be saved. And it becomes very, very popular north and south. Um, there's some details here. The new lights versus the old lights. The old lights were the old Calvinist. The new lights are the new great awakening preachers. And so the new lights, boom, are more popular. The old lights, these are the people in the East Coast. These are the Puritans who um, still believed. But they are diminished in popularity and in number. One of the new lights, one of the big one that you got to pay attention to is Jonathan Edwards and this guy named George Whitfield. Those are names that were preachers that traveled. Again, their sermons, Jeremiah's, are graphic depictions of hell. And um, this is a big one. Uh, moving on, moving on. It's the sinners in the hands of an angry God. This is a um, this was a, uh, a sermon by. Jonathan Edwards, and let's take a look at what that is. Listen to this. This is 40 minutes. We're not doing the whole thing. We would rather be buried somewhere else than there uh, because of the stance that that university takes through time, and it seems to imply the following relating to the punishment and the destruction to which these wicked Israelites were exposed. His arbitrary will, restrained by no obligation and hindered by no manner of difficulty, Okay, this is boring. I'm not going to spend time on that. But I, let me look at, um, let me see if I can't. Um, let me see if I can't find sinners in the hands of an angry God. Here it is. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. It's a long... Um, it's a long ser sermon, but let's look at it for a minute. Um, you are probably not sensible of this, and you find you are kept out of hell, but you don't see the hand of God in it. But look at other things that say the good state of your bodily constitution, your, your care of your own life, and the means for your own good preservation. But indeed, these things are nothing. If God should withdraw his hand, they would avail you no more to keep you from falling than the thin air that hold, uh, to hold a person that is suspended in it. 
this is fire and brimstone. Look at this. Your wickedness makes you as heavy as lead and tend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink in the swiftly descended and plunge into the bottomless gulf of your and your healthy constitution and your own care and prudence, your best contrivance, all your righteousness would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. Were it not that, so is the sovereign pleasure of God. The earth would not bear you for one minute, for you are a burden in it. The creation groans with you. You are a sinner. And the, again, the message is fear God, focus on being a good person, and you will uh, be saved. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. On that note, we've got one more um, program on this unit, and that's about Bacon's Rebellion, and then the French and Indian War, and then we'll come back to some others. So let's stop there and please summarize the main ideas and do your takeaway essays and responses. And um, again, Hopefully you're clear on these last items, Salem Witch Trials, First Great Awakening, and Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Thanks so much. Have a great day. And a